So, um, do you ever feel, pre- I'm sure you did, pre- you felt pressure and stress, but like, how did you handle that? Um, you handled it pretty much because everybody else was under pressure and stress. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of guys, a lot of guys broke up. They had, you know, especially if you don't get any sleep. You know, the times there we didn't sleep for two or three days, you know, and uh, they keep you up all night fighting. Um, one time, I'll never forget it, we were on a line and, and uh, uh, we were up all night and they were shooting flares, you know, from in back of us because there was were, were a big hill over here and then there was a gully coming down and then coming up to a hill and we were guarding on the hill and I was over this side and I had the machine gun shooting down to the, the valley and we could see them coming down. We were peppering away at them. I mean, we'd kill them by the hundreds and uh, the Chinese. And, I mean, they were stupid to, to try to do that. They used to blow bugles and, and whistles. They didn't have radios, so they had bugles and ra- I mean whistles, and then two whistles meant they would go to the left or the right or whatever it is. And, uh, and we stayed there for three nights, and, and, uh, um, and at that time I wasn't a squad leader, but I was a gunner, and, and I dug the hole for the gun. Um, and then um, I, there was a, a foxhole in the back that was already dug, so I laid my poncho down and I slept there. And the next day I uh, got up and the lieutenant came around and he said, well, we're going to stay here for a couple of days, dig those holes deeper. So I dug the, the uh, machine gun hole deeper to put sandbags. We used to carry bags and fill them with sand. It wasn't really sand, it was, it was dirt. And you pile them around the guns so that you know that they would absorb any any shrapnel or bombs or bullets or anything like that. And you try to build like you know, a parapet. Anyway, uh, um, I went back to dig my hole deeper, and I I was in back of the gun, uh, you know, and I had the first hole back there. So I take my entrenching tool and I jump down and I'm digging. All of a sudden, I see a sweater, and I say, gee, what the hell is a sweater? Somebody, we used to throw things away and, you know, throw them in the holes, and they started getting warm. This was in April, I guess, of, uh, of 51, and with this, I'm tugging on the sweater, and there was this body in there that I slept on all night long that came up sideways, and I took a look at it, and I said, I ain't going to dig that hole in there. Put them down and shoveled them up. And, I never knew if it was Chinese or American or whatever it was. I wasn't about to find out because he was smelling like you wouldn't believe. And uh, I let him stay in the hole and covered him up with dirt and then went out. And, and for many days after that, they used to talk about my foxhole companion. Hey, Ozzy, uh, you got a foxhole companion in this hole or something like that? You know, they, they, they to this day they would laugh about it. You know, uh, some of the guys who were in my squad. There's really maybe only one guy left in my squad right now uh, out, of, out of them all. But, but uh, uh, you, you have days like that. You have stress. I mean, sleeping on top of a guy that was dead. He was maybe only with this much dirt between me and him. And that, like I said, that was at night. So kind of smelled a little bit. And uh, a couple of other times it was some dead guys in front of the, the gun that we had killed and I had to drag them away because after the second night they they smell something awful. What happens is the body would blow up. They retain water. And it looked like the guy put on a, uh, on a a shirt that was two sizes, three sizes too small for him. And the body would just blow up and, and it start to smell and then they would have what they call grave registration. These guys coming around with body bags, and they would take the bodies and put them into these bags and try to find out who they were by their dog tags. I show you the dog tags that I had over there. Well, you had two dog tags on there, and one dog tag uh, they would leave on the body, and the other dog tag they would put on the on the bag to uh, identify that that was the person. You had two dog tags. 
one for you, one for the body, I mean, one for the body bag. So, so do you um, remember like any good luck uh, things people would do, like any like trinkets that would keep on them, or oh, something yeah. that you did? Yeah. I had a miraculous medal. I think my mother gave it to me for confirmation, and I wore that. I guess that was good. And last time I seen that uh, uh, was uh, where my wallet was. Was uh, in that when they took me off of the hill and they patched me up, and there was a bullet and some shrapnel that they took out of me. It was on there. And, I just left it all. I was too out of it. They kept shooting me with morphine every four hours. And that morphine was great. <laughs> so you're at the Never Level and uh, I had I had that morphine and I had Demerol, I think it was, for about three months because the pain was so severe. You know? And one day I got to San Antonio, Texas, and the doctor said, uh, Did you take a morphine? Demerol? I said, Yeah. I said, you shouldn't need that. I said, what do you need that for? I said, you, you should be all right. We'll give you some sleeping pill to put you to sleep at night. And I got off with it. So I had a little problem with it there for a while because it was so nice. I used to say, I thought it was the nurse that was coming in who looked so good to give me a shot when, when some crummy old corpsman came in and gave me a shot at night and I was looking forward to seeing him. I knew that I was had a little problem with that. You know. But... Uh, 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 a lot of guys had, had uh, we weren't allowed to have a diary or anything like that. You weren't allowed to, to have anything that showed what it was. The, the Chinese used to have uh, what they called pay book. Um, and we used to search the bodies when we see it. And uh, uh, you know, they would have, we would search them to, to get some information from them to see if they uh, recognize what outfit it is, you know, what company, what, they did the same thing to us. And so we weren't really allowed to have anything on our personal that would, would show your name or rank or serial them. You know, the, the card that you had, you didn't have that card. You turned that in before you went into, into combat. You turned that in, threw my sea bag over this uh, big pile in Japan. I had a sea bag that filled with all of your clothes and. You, you would wear uh, uh, underwear, socks, long underwear, uh, uh, a wool shirt, wool trousers, uh, uh, what they call foul weather gear, like a, uh, a rain suit type of thing, you know, only, and, and, and then a, a field jacket, a parker, uh, uh, gloves, mittens with the trigger finger so that you could fire the gun with the trigger finger, a wool hat with you ever see these guys with the North Pole? They, they had the, the fur that's around the, the face, and, uh, and that's the only thing that kept you warm. They gave us all of that stuff, and I threw the my sea bag in a pile over there, and I, I took a look at it, and I see the big pile. It must have been 500 sea bags there. And I had my name on it and everything else. And they said, I'll never see that thing again. Well, about six months later, it turned up in St. Albans Naval Hospital and in the ward. And they said, uh, Stack, yeah, uh, we have something for you downstairs. In the meantime, I forgot the combination to the locker. It was, it was what, eight months later, nine months later? I couldn't remember what the combination to the locker was. So they had to cut the, uh, the sea bag open or the locker off of there. And, uh, and then inside it was the stuff that I threw in in, in Japan. Nine months later, or eight months later, I think it was. I think it was in August of. I think it was in August of uh, of '51. Yeah, August of September. But in the meantime, I got uniforms before that, and I got all of these uniforms back. So I had a double ration of uniforms. Huh. Well, I'm sure you didn't really have much time, but do you recall any ways that you and your unit would entertain themselves? Um. We really. There's a guy that had a, a guitar and you know, a southern guy that used to sing songs and things like that. But very seldom were we ever, you know, I, the only time I was in Seoul was when Seoul was burning. And, you know, I often heard about uh, there was a 
place in Shanghai and, and in Seoul, Korea, it was known Ping Pong Louis, the house of the thousand assholes. It was a house of prostitution. And we used to name it the, uh, uh, the Oriental distributor for the clap, gonorrhea over there. And some of the guys used to go into places like that, but I never went in because uh, uh, the first time I walked into the place and I thought it was a bar and it looked kind of crummy, uh, Ping Pong Louis wasn't my type of place. And uh, as far as like shows and things like that, we didn't have any. Uh, no USO shows or anything? No. The whole time I was over there, we were fighting to stay alive where, you know, Bob Hope wouldn't show up. They, they, oh, Hope was over there, but not in our sector, you know. Uh, radios, we'd hear radios coming from um, tanks and things like that. Uh, but uh, went to church a few times, you know, the chaplain came up and said Mass, and there's one hill, we called it uh, Old Smoky, it was took us a whole day to climb to the top of the hill from 9 o'clock in the morning to 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It was a hill like this and, and uh, got up there and it was Easter Sunday uh, the next day and the chaplain had brought uh, bread up, the, what they call the chidi bears. That was the Koreans that used to carry those eight frames that I told you. And he gave uh, each squad a loaf of bread and said mass up there. And then uh, we went out on patrol and it was snowing like the son of a gun. And um, it was good, great to get a loaf of bread for eight guys that they just sliced it up into eight little slices. You know, that was that was a treat. Um, so you did not go on leave at all while you were there? No, no. Just when you got injured, you went back? No, 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 no <laughs> whatsoever, no. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't have that rest and re they call it R and R, rest yeah, and recuperation. Right. They they had that uh, in I think it was September or October of the year that I left. And they were allowing the guys to go over to Japan. Uh, they would take them off the line and give them was it five days, I think it was, or seven days. I can't remember what they said. That was a pretty good deal. But all the time I was there, we never got. We used to get paid. Uh, and what they call script. Do you ever hear what script is? Oh, okay. Do you ever play Monopoly? Yeah. It looked like Monopoly money. And it would be different colors. Um, black market was really, especially in Japan and China and places like that, the black market was... Uh, so you got paid in script which was orange money, or yellow money, or blue money, or green money, or something like that. And um, once a week, once a month, they would pay you and, and you'd say, you know, how much do you need? I used to buy eggs. You know, when I get to a farm and I, I and it was 5,000 won to a dollar, I think it was. The won was the Korean money. And, uh, and I would pay like, uh, 500 yen, I mean 500 won, and get uh, four eggs, five eggs, and then whip them up and cook them. And I loved eggs at the time. You know, I could eat. One day I ate 19 eggs, one right after the other. And um, and then they would pay you in script, which would be, uh, let's say, orange money at that time. And you'd have maybe $20 or $30 or $40 in, in, in one or script that you could change into one. And, uh, and then they would have the stop the black market, the, the black marketeers from doing anything. They would, in one day, you had to turn all of your money in, your orange money for, say, blue money, blue script. And if uh, I was a corporal at the time, I still make a $92 a month, so they knew how long you were over there. So if you turned in, say, $1,000 in script because you were in the black market, 
selling shoes or selling blankets or to the natives or you know to the Koreans or something like that and getting money back. Um, uh, they knew that you were. Where did you get the money from? You weren't allowed to gamble. You weren't allowed to have. So if you were making ninety-two dollars a month and say you were over there for five months, well, that was four hundred and fifty dollars or something like that. So if you had a thousand dollars in script, where did you get it from? And say so they would stop the black marketers. And then I used to have guys that say, uh, "She's asking, uh, how much do you have?" And I say, "Well, I got twenty dollars in script." They say here's fifty, which you uh, turned it in for me, and, and you know, and like I said, you go up to a like a paymaster, and they would set up a table, and, <clears throat> and it would be uh, uh, so much script that uh, uh, changing the colors, and they give you 24 hours to change that. Except if you were on the line, if you were on the combat line, then when you came off of that, then they quarantined you and said, you know, here's you know, 150 guys that, that have script or, or orange script and you can change it into blue script. So as far as uh, the only time I, like I said, the only time I had anything to do with it was when I buy eggs or, or you know, guys used to use it for drugs and things like that that were over there. There was a lot of opium, uh, not much marijuana at the time. It was some, but it was mostly opium. And they smoke it. Which I never did because I didn't think that I go in my mind to be alert at all times. When you get into a situation where you're they're shooting that shit, you want to make sure that you don't go off half cocked. You want to make sure that you know what you're you're doing. I always used to say to myself, okay. Hunt it down, stay on the ground until you know where they're shooting from. Don't go off half cocked. And, and these guys used to take this opium. That, uh, you know, they wouldn't do too good. We used to get a beer ration every now and then. You know, when we come off the line, go back into reserve, and then give you, say, two cans of beer for free. You know, we didn't even have to pay for it. And uh, a couple of times there, I traded some of my sea ration in for some extra beers and I had six or seven beers and we had a party we way in back of the line so you know you get half schnockered on a six or seven beers by that time and, uh, and uh, sleep well that night and wake up uh, the next morning but, but I wouldn't do it on the line and they wouldn't give you anything. There was a lot of uh, apple cider that was, uh, uh, they used to call it uh, they didn't call it cider, they called it apple something or other. And it was fermented apples into alcohol. And I never drank that because you didn't know if it was any good or not. So do you recall any like humorous or unusual events while you're there? Did you play any pranks on each other? Um one time, um uh we stole a crate of ham. Uh, ham steaks, and and had a hell of a time walking by a this army base, and uh, we were trying to scrounge some shoes. We had holes in the shoes and so on. We found out that there was this uh, quartermaster over there at uh, um, in this army base, and we went down to see if we could black market again. You know, see a guy, and if he had a pair of shoes, we could buy it from him. With the, with the script, we had script, you know, and, and um, smoking by the mess hall, one of the guys says, uh, look at that crate over there. And take a look at it, and I said, what is it? I said, I don't know, he said, let's go find out. A guy by the name of Corso, his name was from New Jersey, and uh, he was the biggest scrounger going, and he comes back and he says, it's a, it's a whole crate of ham steaks, it was a crate of us. This big and about this high, it must have been 50, 75 ham steaks in there. So uh, he, uh, he said, Well, we'll come back later when it gets dark. And uh, he said, If it's still out there, we'll bring it home. You know? And uh, we, they went, I didn't go. Uh, of course, so two or three other guys, they came back with the ham steaks. 
And of course, it was cold. It was so we had the frying. Uh, in I have to have a fire, and we, we were back in the in, in, in the reserves, so we were able to get that. And then a couple of days later, um, we stole the uh, a whole can of, of uh, donut mix, but we didn't have the fat to make the donuts in, so we were making cakes, and we were making an oven out of a out of a tin can. And building a fire underneath it, and putting this, and and we were eating this kind of raw uh, mix. You know, it was we'd have to bake it really good, and, uh, and then we captured some horses one time. And some of the guys from Texas, and there was a lot of guys from Texas in our outfit. In fact, I would say, out of all of the states. It was probably the most guys were from Texas. It was a Texas uh, reserve unit. <clears throat> and they were riding those horses. And we kept those horses for ammunition, pack horses, for maybe about a week or two. And then they found out that we had the horses. And they needed the horses to go up this one mountain with this recoilless rifle. I mean, it's a recoilless rifle. It's like a cannon. I mean, that thing was as long as that couch over there must have been six or eight feet long and then the tripod so they said they were going to requisition the horses to take the uh, uh, the recoilless rifle up the hill and they killed them I mean they drove them up so much they just collapsed halfway up the hill and, and they died so we didn't have any horses to back our backs anymore so but uh, they were Mongolian ponies because the Mongolians were part of the Chinese force. And, uh, and they were ponies that they weren't really full horses. They were maybe about three quarters of what a horse is. And a, and a Mongolian pony is, is short legs and they, they run like this. And, um, and they, uh, um, we had those, like I said, for probably about a week or two. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun. I never got a chance to ride one because I didn't know how to ride a horse. But some of the Texas boys, they they liked them. So. so, what did you think of your officers and your fellow servicemen? Uh, Ninety percent of them were great. We had what we call in the Marine Corps mustangs. Not to be you know, talking about horses before they're not <clears throat> in the Marine Corps. A Mustang is an officer who was an enlisted man at one time. It was known as Officer Mustangs and Ring Knockers. Well, a Ring Knocker was a guy that had a ring from Annapolis, a graduation ring. And, you know, he'd give you this. It, it, uh, they'd tell you that they went to Annapolis. Uh, he got uh, commissioned in the Navy and then got commissioned in the Marine Corps. And then there was the Mustang that came up from a private sergeant you know, and then became officers. Uh, probably about, uh, I'd say 60 to 70 percent of our officers were Mustangs. They fought in the Second World War. Some hit places like Saipan, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. Um, got out of the service in 45, 46, went to school on the GI Bill, joined the reserves, uh, a call back in in 1950, and they were the best officers, the Mustangs, because they knew exactly what, you know, what it was. We had a guy by the name of Pat McGann who was, and I got together with him after a while. He became, uh, he was a, an attorney for Trump. Down in uh, in Atlantic City, he was a a lawyer. He, he came out of the Marine Corps, and, and uh, he was uh, 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 wasn't a ring knocker. He was a guy that went to college. He went to St. Mary's College down in Pennsylvania. Uh, went into ROTC. Uh, when he graduated, he became uh, <clears throat> the second lieutenant because they went to Quantico, Virginia, and spent uh, two summers down there. 
uh, the training, and uh, he's a good guy, but he wasn't as good as the guys that would have known as combat. I mean, he uh, he was a very good man, but uh, didn't have the experience that the uh, Mustangs had. Most of the, like I said, most of those Mustangs were uh, captains, majors, lieutenants, and, and so on, and uh, they had the experience of, uh, of being in combat in the Second World War, which you need experience. Do you recall what it was like when you were discharged and where you were when your service ended? Well, the first time I got discharged was out of Quantico, Virginia in, uh, um, in 1949. The second time I got discharged, I didn't get discharged, I got released from active duty. I was in the reserves. I was up in a, a base in uh, Schenectady, New York. It was uh, called uh, uh, Scotia Naval Supply Depot. We, we have precious metals up there. But the Navy used um, metals like lead, zinc, copper, gold, silver, and we got at the base. And how I got that was that I was on funeral detail. Um, when I got out of the hospital in uh, in December of uh, of uh, 1951, uh, I uh, went back to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and I was on guard duty there. And, uh, and this one guy I knew from uh, the 22nd Marines down in Quantico who told me about the funeral details that was going out and having burial details for the guys that were killed in the, in the war. And uh, I did that uh, three times. And the last time I did it was up in Amsterdam, New York, and the sailor, he wasn't Marine, he was a sailor. Uh, he got killed aboard ship, which ship it was out there, I don't know. And, and we used to take the bodies out of the ships. They used to transport them back by ship. And they would be in coffins. and encased in, in, uh, in like concrete. And what you would do is uh, uh, bring them up to their hometown. You'd call up the, uh, the funeral parlor and say, I got so-and-so, uh, we're gonna bring them up whatever day you want, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or whatever it is, when the ship came in. These bodies were dead maybe five, six, seven months, you know, by the time they got shipped back to the States, because the, the parents had a, had a, a, a choice between do you want to buried over there in the in the cemeteries there or bring the bodies home to be buried in, in the family plot. There's much better detail than, than uh, funeral details. And I see them coming back now that uh, and even when we bury one of our own guys you know uh, they they have a um, uh, a ceremony you see them down in Arlington and so on. We buried several of our guys down in Arlington Cemetery. And uh, uh, it's sad. Yeah. So do you recall what your homecoming was like when you saw your family or when? Oh, yeah. yeah. I was in a, a St. Alden Naval Hospital and my mother and father came up to see me and right after I got there. And I wanted to walk out, so they took the splints off my legs, and I was able to walk out. And uh, uh, it was a good day to be back home. Then they used to let me go on uh, Wednesday nights and every other weekend. You could go home. And I was only maybe an hour away from the house at the very most. So you had to stay in the hospital when you went back? Oh, yeah. I stayed in the hospital from... I uh, got there in, uh, oh, sometime late July, early August to uh, uh, December. And they closed up the colostomy. They did what they call a reversal. They reopened your intestines again. Instead of the fecal matter coming out, you were able to use the uh, rear end. So what did you do uh, in the days and weeks afterward when you got back? Uh, I mean, when I got discharged, I was separated. You went back home. Yeah. Well, I stayed in the hospital for uh, uh, another four or five months. 
until I got recuperated, and then they sent me over to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and that's when I went on the funeral details, and and then uh, in February of uh, of uh, it was late January, early February, I went to that Naval Supply Depot, and then uh, uh, about a week or two before I got uh, released from active duty, he, uh, uh, the major called me down and he said, "Here, you can go." He said, "We're all finished with you." So I, uh, I used to go to the hospital every month to get checked out. I had to try and uh, go down by train from Schenectady down to uh, uh, St. Albans, and then they had a test that they had to take uh, uh, to see that there was no holes left in the uh, intestines. And, uh, and then uh, 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 after I uh, got back, I, I went over to the Naval Hospital and they tested me again and they said, you're all right. And, uh, uh, and I stayed there and I, I went back uh, uh, to the police department and they wouldn't take me because I couldn't pass the physical at that time. So I went to work uh, back to the brewery and, uh, and they sent me up here to Hartford, their branch up here. And uh, I was getting 75 bucks a week and $15 a week for my car, car allowance. And the policemen, my friends were on, went on the police department, they were getting $54 a week with no car payments. And I said, this is a better deal with being a policeman. It didn't take me too long to find that out. Making $75 was better than $54. So. I, I transferred up here to uh, Connecticut, and then about a year later, I got married and, uh, and started a family. We stayed up here. Got transferred back to New York in '57, but uh, stayed back up here instead. Yeah. So you didn't use the GI Bill to go to school? No, I I, uh, uh, I went to school for a little bit after that, but then we had a family, and you know, that car payments and house payments and everything else. Gee, I knew it was good to us. You know, it was a very good thing. I got my first house with seven hundred dollars down. It's not a bad deal. Okay. And you said you continue to stay friends with a lot of people that were in the service with you. Oh yeah, when in uh, the early eighties, I got a telephone call one night in the middle of the night, and they said, uh, uh, you know, you. At that time, you didn't have the computers, the printouts, you know, where you could look up somebody. And I got a call from uh, this guy Corso, his name was, you know, and uh, he said, are you, uh, said Austin Stack, nobody knew me by it except Ozzy. You know. Are you the guy that used to work for Rangold? And I said, yeah. And uh, he said, were you, uh, you know, over in Korea in, uh, in 1950? Yeah, I said, yeah. He said, this, this is Sam Corso. He was calling from California, and he said that they were with the 1st Marine Division out there. And the 1st Marine Division used to have a, a reunion every year. I went to one down in New York in 1955, I think it was. There was only one guy I seen that, that I knew. Um, and we didn't really go in much for reunions and things like that, but as we got older, then uh, this one guy started to form a, uh, uh, a basic banded uh, uh, reunion. Then we started to get together in 83, 84, 85, uh, and then every year after that. Uh, we'd, we'd got, I, I had one up in Boston in 2003, I think it was, a reunion. And then I had another one uh, two years ago down in Florida, where I, uh, I maybe had, and up in Boston we had like, almost 200 but uh, last year like I said uh, there was maybe 15 20 of us not too many left and um, how did the military ex uh, experience influence your way of thinking uh, I'm pro-military uh, your generation is not but our generation was, uh, it's better to beat them over there than to fight them over here. Uh, don't forget, the, they didn't call it the greatest generation for nothing. 
those guys in the Second World War that beat the uh, uh, the Nazis and beat the Japanese. Uh, you weren't too far from from being beaten ourselves in 1941-42. We were very close to losing that war. There was, was a lot of luck and, and a lot of fighting, and you know you had 400,000 people that died in the Second World War. Um, if they didn't fight, uh, half of this country would be under the Japanese rule and the other half under the German rule. It wouldn't have been pretty. The only thing that saved us was two oceans. Uh, Today, there's no, the oceans don't count. Yeah. Did you join any um, veteran organizations? Not really. Uh -huh. um, uh, when I came home, I had was too busy raising a family and trying to get a career going. Uh, um, stayed with Rheingold until 1974. Then I formed my own beer distributorship in 1974 until today. Huh. So I um, um, spent a lot of time uh, uh, working. Had seven children. Seven. Spent a lot of time. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of energy and a lot of money and, uh, and tuitions and, and and so on. So, but the military was a great. I think was a a, a, a great institution, and and I admire the young men that today go in there and, and fight that war over there in uh, uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. But the only thing that bothers me. Is they coming back with psychological problems? Why I don't know. Korea wasn't bad. We had psychological problems there. Vietnam had an awful lot of problems. There was a tremendous amount of drugs over in Vietnam, and um, it it bothered me to see those guys coming back that were were had this PTSD they call it. I don't know if I ever had PTSD. They, 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 we, used to, we used to call it the going bonkers or something like that. They had a few guys that, that just couldn't take it anymore. And I don't blame them. Some of my friends that I see today, you know, had it. Uh, you can't blame them. They, they just got so fed up with diarrhea and, and no sleep and, and, uh, and all of the other things. Uh, but it bothers me today that they're coming back and it seems like half of them have post-traumatic stress syndrome. Why? No. I don't know why. It bothers me. How was the transition for you when you came home? Well, I got out of the Marine Corps on the 4th of February. I was up here working on the 23rd of April. I Used all my money to buy two new suits, borrowed money to get a car. Came up here as a salesman, at 21 years old. Uh, worked from eight o'clock in the morning until six o'clock at night. Transition was all right. I don't know if I had any problems psychologically. I looked back and had a couple of bad dreams once in a while, but. Uh, the only thing that bothered me was burying that guy. You know? And again, every time I think of it, I, I well up. But we had a, a, a big to do with the train station in Amsterdam. We what we did was we took the body and we put it onto. Well, you know, it it it, it was in a, a mail carrier car, and uh, that's where you had it. you draped the flag over it, and we had five of us. It was myself and then four, four guys. I was sergeant at that time. And you got to the train station, and you you took the the uh, uh, the coffin off, and you put it on one of these carriers for the for the big carry uh, big carrier that they have for the uh, suitcases and things at that time. The main line of the thing at that time was was trains. Planes were you know. Uh, the airports weren't, you know, transportation wasn't that, that good at that time, except for the train. 
And then the, the funeral parlor, the hearse would pull up to the train station, and this was a wide open train station, like you have down in Berlin. You ever been to Berlin train station? Yeah. Down here? Well, uh, and, uh, and, and you take the body and you, and you put it into the hearse, and then for two days, you know, you would have a, a guard around the body and flag draped and uh, uh, and there was a lot of drinking going on afterwards. We went over to the VFW afterwards and had a lot to drink. It made me get schnockered. And, and after that, I just went back to the Brooklyn Navy office and said, I'm not doing this anymore. So, um, did I have a little problem then? I probably drank too much for the first several months. Looking back at it, uh, that was the only problem I think I had. Other than that, I was too damn busy to to have problems. I guess some of the guys had uh, had what's known as PTSD. There's one guy that's that's still alive today, and I talk to him every now and then. But uh, you want to know something? Uh, they put the thought in his mind. He said, uh, "Ozzy," I said, "How'd you get that?" They got 100% disability. PTSD, and he said, uh, the stock they asked me one day, he said, I've been a truck driver all my life, I didn't have any money. He said, uh, he said uh, do you have had bad dreams about uh, your combat experience? He says, yeah. He said, uh, does it bother you? He says, yeah. He said, well, he says, you, you know, you could have post-traumatic stress syndrome. And Lenny Enos, big heavy set guy, he became a staff sergeant. He served 10 years in the corps. Got the Silver Star over there, uh, Purple Heart. Uh, and he said, Ozzy, he said, uh, they're going to give me $2,600 a month. So I said, yeah, I have it. <laughs> so I get $2,600 every month mailed to me. So is it for the money? I don't blame him. You know, here he is. At, uh, you know, Lenny is, uh, I think he's 84 years old now. And I just talked to him about two weeks ago about the reunion this year. And, uh, but I was surprised that he was, uh, he was getting that. You, know. you mentioned earlier that um, your military experience like made you pro-military for today. Yeah. Has it changed the way you view life in general or the experiences that you had? No way, yeah, it will. Can you describe it? Um, like I said, it's, it's better to beat them over there than have them come over here and beat us. Look what's happening today with, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about Guantanamo Bay, it doesn't bother me that they waterboard some son of a bitch. It doesn't bother me one iota. It didn't bother me, bother me the first time when I seen the guy pop, hit the guy in the side of the head and knock him down. That bothered me. Uh, two weeks later, I was the first guy up there to hit them on the side of the head, point a pistol at him and tell him I'd blow his brains out if he didn't tell us what was happening up on top of the hill. Uh, today, um, you catch one of these ISIL guys or whatever the hell they are, they call him, and he's going to blow up some building and kill hundreds of people and come kind of blow up a school like they did over in Russia or blow up a, a, a subway like they did over in uh, in, uh, uh, in England or a train that they killed uh, many people over there in Spain. And you can waterboard a guy or, or stick a pistol in his mouth and tell him you're going to pull the trigger and blow his brains out if he doesn't tell you where the next bombing is going to be. It doesn't bother me when I go to uh, that you use that method. What, to save somebody? One of the saddest things I ever seen was uh, uh, over in England that they bombed a, uh, a department store and two or three, several years later, this bride was going down the, the aisle um, and she lost both the legs. Or some son of a bitch wants to make a, a political statement 
what statement did they get? That, that they want land, that to uh, live on the land together. Whether you're a, an Arab or a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim or whatever it is, live on the land together. Don't go blowing people up. And you know that woman that uh, didn't have any legs and she's walking down the aisle and I, I seen the picture in the paper and I'm saying to myself, if, if you could prevent that by waterboarding somebody or intimidating him to, or, or starving him or, is that torture? No, that's not torture. Torture is when uh, you cut a guy's head off, like ISIS does it. That's torture. Waterboarding somebody is not torture. Or hitting them on the side of the head. We had a congressman down in, in uh, you know, name was West. You probably heard of him down in Florida. That uh, he was over in Iraq and uh, and uh, they captured two of his men, and he captured one of their guys. And he said, "You better tell me where they took our prison, your prisoners." And he said, "No, I'm not going to tell you." He put a pistol in his mouth and he loaded it. And, pulled a hammer back and he said, if you don't tell me, within the time I count ten, then it'll blow your brains out. This was, and he got court-martialed for it, because the other soldiers said he did it. And the guy told him the house that they were in, the two soldiers that he had, two or three soldiers that got captured, and he went over there and they released him. Nobody got hurt. He was intimidated a lot, but is that torture? If he would have blown his head off, he probably would have been tortured. And if he would have blown his head off, he would have been sitting in Leavenworth someplace. He got he was a major, got kicked out of the army because of that. Did he save two lives? Was it worth it? Is there anything else that you would like to add that we didn't cover so far? No, that's about it. And I think the, you know, we could stop all the wars and and the uh, if you go down to these hospitals, I spent uh, uh, six months in a hospital, and I've seen guys from the Second World War, and I even go over to the VA today, and, and I have to go there once a year to get a checkup, you know, make sure that I don't have, I guess, sh still got shrapnel in my legs and my arms, and, and, and so on. And, uh, when you walk through the wards and you see these guys that, that have no legs or no arms or sometimes no legs and no arms either, what are wars for? Because some stupid politician said, you know, that's our land over there, let's take it away from them. Defend yourself, sure. Uh, if, uh, if all of those ISIL, uh, ISIS people are or whatever it is that are blowing up uh, people in this country, if they gave it up tomorrow and went home and, and sold beer or loaded trucks or or grew blueberries or whatever it is, they'd be a lot better off than than uh, maiming people and uh, uh, and having somebody with no legs and no arms or blind. I, I remember one guy that was in the hospital with me, and, and uh, uh, he had no controls over his bowels. He had no control over his his kidneys or anything like that. And he was a kid about 20 years old. He lived up in Maine, someplace. And uh, you know, that to me is just a terrible thing to happen. You know, what do we need that for? So to stop all the wars, then. And you won't have this problem. Well, Ozzy, I'd like to thank you for your service and for your time for interview, uh, the interview today.